we are welcoming John Seal today, um, who is the BAFTA nominated cinematographer for Mad Max Fury Road. Welcome, John. It's really lovely to have you with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I kind of want to ask about your process. So where does it all begin for you? Well, I was uh, uh, not involved in Mad Max um, at all. I, it was in, sort of in, in prep for about 10 years, really. They, they started it up, got it going, went to Africa, and then all bailed out prior to shooting because of uh, uh, wars in the Middle East and everybody felt that that wasn't a good time to be in Africa. So they pulled out and uh, years later, three years later, they regrouped and, and started to go back in. While they were prepping in Sydney, I was hearing all the rumours. Very interesting that, you know, five or six years before, the studio uh, asked George to shoot 3D. And because he knew the nature of the story uh, and that 40 to 50% of the, the, the film would be inside the cab of that warring truck, he had to have a camera that would go through the windows uh, or the sunroof or be inside with five girls in the back seat and two people in the front seat and fit a, cam a 3D camera in there as well. And at the time, uh, there wasn't a 3D camera made in the world that was small enough to do anything like that. Um, so George, being George, st started building his own. And uh, by the time I came on board, two and a half months before shooting, they'd used it on Happy Feet for the live action segment of that. Um, but it still had a lot of problems when I came on board. So I, I was hearing all these problems. And then suddenly the phone rang and I was having a problem. So. <laughs> Uh, but it was very exciting. I always thought, you know, I'd, I'd love to work in the film industry and that would be really exciting. Uh, but never, th you know, had no contacts, no friends, no, no way of, you know, getting into it. So I'd, I always imagined it was going to be, it's not going to happen, you know, that it was just like a, a dream. But, you know, I'll give it a go anyway. So I made tons of little films. My friends, my grandmother had a camera I could borrow, VHSC. Uh, and we shot films together, little action films and uh, bits and pieces. And then down the line, I um, tried to get into film school uh, because this is what I really want to try out. But there's, there's a short course you can do in Denmark, which also is, uh, it's, you can apply uh, all over the world. Half, half, it's half Danes and then half international. And it's called European Film College. And it's brilliant. You know, it's an eight month course and you have, uh, you have cameras, you have studios, you have everything for eight months and you live there. Uh, so I, I got into that, uh, there's 100 students a year, and you suddenly, I suddenly found out that uh, I wasn't, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I always thought that if I ever got into the film industry that I'd, I'd be really bad at it, you know, that I wasn't, you know, that everybody knew more than me. And then trying out that course, I suddenly real, realized that, no, you know, I actually know as much as the rest of these guys, you know, so, so why can't I pursue this further? And so I did the eight months and, and then thought I'll, I'll give this a go, I'll carry on, and then, you know, really try hard for film school. So I got in and I, I tried to just get a job in film production as a runner, as, you know, different, different types of jobs as you can get, and, and ended, ended up doing uh, lighting. Uh, so a spark, you know, setting up the lamps, that kind of stuff. And, uh, and then moved my way up to Gaffer, but always with the aim uh, of, of to become a, a, a cinematographer myself. Uh, and so and during that process, I then ended up shooting lots of short films, no budget, no budget short films. And then that gave me the chance to get into film school. My name's Ben Davis. I am a cinematographer or, if you like, DOP or cameraman, one of those titles. Pick, pick which one you want. Um, and I'm here with three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. Depending on the size of the film and the budget, uh, I will come on uh, for prep on an independent film. Let's talk specifically about three billboards. Would would have been about five or six weeks of prep. On larger studio movies, they may be up to ten weeks of prep. So I will come on six weeks beforehand in the planning process, mostly starting with script and meetings with director, discussing an approach, and then. And that becomes a more of a planning process and logistics. Um, hopefully you don't lose sight of the creative process during that period. Then prep will finish and we'll start principal photography. Um, and well, again, depending on the type of film, size of the film, uh, that will 
independent films between six and eight weeks. Larger projects can be up to 95 days shooting. But yeah, and some projects I know that are going to be 25 days. So, so then we'll start principal photography. Usually at the end of principal photography, uh, that will end my involvement in the film for some time until the edit is finished and then I'll be involved in post-production uh, visual effects approvals and grading um, at the end of that process. Where George is wonderful, I think, is that he, do, he won't let any shot become gratuitous. Uh, I think as a lot of people are doing these days where on an action scene they'll, they might throw in some whip pan blurs just to sort of give it energy, or, but you don't know what's happening. Um, George won't do that. Every shot has to pay its way and every shot has to count. So if in an audience reaction screening they say, well, I didn't understand what that shot was, he'd pull it out and change it. So he worked very hard in editing with Margaret Sixel, his editor, uh, to make sure that that happened and that there isn't a shot in the movie that is gratuitous. It's, it's all understood and helps to, helps to um, progress the story in, in a logical manner. You have to be very adaptable when you, um, when you work in TV drama. I think every drama always, always will very often require its own style, its own pace. Uh, uh, so I, I, always, and I always try to find that. You know, sometimes it depends what kind of program you work in, and also sometimes, you, uh, sometimes you're setting it up, and then you're allowed to sort of set the style, set set the mood, set the tempo. Uh, but other times you are maybe doing a second block or a second series of, of a, an existing show, and then I think it's very important to be able to be a chameleon and be able to sort of fit into someone else's you know show and 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 do you know the lighting in a way that that you like, of course, but, but also so that, that fits the show and, and complements what they've been doing so far, you know. It, it, it's literally collaborating with the uh, various HODs across the board. Uh, they're the people who make any project work and uh, working with them to try and, you know, get through the day, or whatever the brief is, or whatever the project is. And it's, it's that intrinsic sense of collaboration with these people who, in, in their own right, costume designers, production designers, sit down, work out how the project's going to evolve. I suppose in the, in the very essence of it, it's what, what, what are the inspirational visuals uh, as, a, as a cinematographer you can reference and how those are all put together to, to formulate what, what, what is going to go down on the screen. Uh, it's an involvement right from the, the very top where the surprise is, you know, you're asked how, how you see things, how, how that process works out. So it, that's the surprise. And then it's getting down to the, the nitty gritty of how you then tackle, you know, day 57 of a 172. And I think it, you, you, you have challenges every day. So you're not, you know, going to wake up and on, on, on one morning and the art director hasn't done something correct. So you're a team, but you're a family and you're going to go from highs to lows. And it's, it's that process when you come out of a 174 day project like the Mafia that you, you suddenly realise, wow, I've been really invested in this, in these people. And I think that's the positive that comes out of any, any project of that scale or size. Well, I think my, as a director of photography, I think the key relationship is with the, the director. Uh, that, that's the person you talk with the most, you know, you sort of, during the production, with the, the shooting of it, you sort of become the team, you're, you're the guys, you know, along with the first AD, you are the team that sort of has to make it happen, you know, and you sort of, you pull the threads and, and make and, 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 and set the tempo of the of the shoot, you know, making sure that you know you're getting through the setups at the right time. So but you know obviously you have to have relationships with, with everybody on the crew. You know, you need to talk to, you know, costume and makeup, you know, you need to talk to the production design, make sure that, you know, the things are are, are ready in in a way that, you know, works for the for the show. We see so much, so many different shots. We have massive kind of views of the citadel and then you have the massive aerial shots of just desert. Um, so, out of all of those, which do you think was the trickiest? Well, the, the, the Citadel, of course, is, uh, is CGI, the, the, the building and, 
And of course, when Max comes out onto that balcony and stops and looks down and there's thousands of people, it's all CGI, it has to be. Um, they're, they're very tricky because you can go to the production designer or storyboard artists or the visual effects man and say, what have you got that I can balance my lighting off onto Max as a uh, live action insert within a, a major frame that's been painted? And I always find that's one of the hardest things with green screen is, uh, is, is matching that lighting on the live action that'll be built into that painting. The shooting out in the desert, totally live action, is a lot easier as far as that's concerned because it's all locked into a continuity of light. Um, but the green screen material is uh, very delicate. So you start off with a creative ambition and look at references and then you'll get into choosing your locations, location scouts, uh, and then it's about, for me, depending on the type of film, it'll be, you know, sort of the, you know, the reality, the, the science of it, which is working out lighting uh, diagrams, how you're going to light stages if there are stages involved, and how you might handle equipment at different locations, what time of day you want to shoot, and that's the process. When, particularly when you do a film which is financed by multiple companies, for instance, or multiple financiers. There'll be a point where as a DP you're asked to turn, they'll, they'll come in for meetings toward, during your prep process and say, hey, you know, and they'll talk to the director about the script. And then I will be called into a room somewhere and they'll say, so what's the film? You know, what are you thinking? What's the film gonna look like? With Martin's films, you know, it's very hard to pinpoint his work because it's, uh, he's a unique voice. So, so I said, I'm not gonna give you any particular reference points, but, you know, I can tell you that the film wants to be, we want it to be very, we want it to have a, Martin's reference points, if there are any, are in 70s filmmaking. So we wanted to sort of, sort of pay homage to that in a way. I mean, and for me, with that particular film, you know, with Three Billboards was, I mean, my guiding principle with it was to keep it as real as possible. Because the characters are all quite extraordinary and the dialogue is very poetic and kind of... You know, and I just felt we really needed to root the characters into some, something real, you know. So, so it was that. And, and a lot of the principle about photographing it was to sort of let the actors do what they want to get out of the way, really. I didn't want, I didn't want people to be looking at the cinematography and going, well, what a beautiful shot, that's great. You know, I didn't want to do long lingering shots through doorways and, because Really, when you've got that, you know, you it, it's a study of character. It's not, a, you know, it's a different kind of movie. You now, every movie's different. I'm not saying that that's the way you photograph every movie, but for that, every movie has its own language visually. I think. Uh, I think I think you have to stay on top of it. Absolutely, you have to know about new developments, new bits of kit that comes out. You know, uh, and and sort of be open to experiment. You know, and, and try out new things. You know, I'm a big fan of LED lighting. You know, the all that kind of. Uh, modern multicolor stuff, you know, which is really handy and really practical. With cameras, you know, they're all so good now, you know, so I'm sort of, I don't really mind, you know, and also that sometimes you don't have a choice, you know, for instance, on the production I'm nominated for, uh, uh, Black Mirror is it's made with Netflix, and Netflix has, uh, only approves cameras that can shoot in 4K, which means that I can't use an Alexa, which would be my preferred camera. Uh, so I had to use a red camera instead. Uh, but, you know, the results are fantastic. You know, the, the, the quality of the cameras are so good now. So, so, so for, first of all, they're so user-friendly, so you can sort of pretty much work it out. How, you know, if you know how your basic knowledge about cameras, you can work it out as you go along. But, but also there's usually an assistant on, on set who, who knows how to press all the right buttons, you know. So as long as I know how to light and how to, you know, uh, run the set and run the crew, then, then you know, it, it's going to be fine, you know. When I think of Mad Max, I think of, you know, the real blue of the sky and the real burnt orange of the ground. Um, and obviously, you can't change the colour of the desert or the sky. But what decisions did you make with accentuating those colours? I hate to disagree, but you can change the colours now of anything. You know, with these computers that they use now for the digital intermediate process in post, is one of the cameramen's uh, best tools. So our colouring, 
uh, a lot of the time was done in post because, you know, with the massive setups we had, uh, the numbers of stuntmen, the, the, the trucks and the uh, numbers of vehicles all involved all the time meant that we couldn't stop and wait for weather. So it, if it was foggy and overcast, which it was on the coast a lot, we shot it. And if it was sunny with acid blue skies 40 miles inland, we shot it. And in the post was a juggle of changing the colour of this and pumping that up and pulling that down. And as George said the other night, they added a bit of mist in for a continuity flow of that. And also the length of shots. If you imagine 2.3 seconds, I remember talking to George about the continuity at one stage and, and I said, George, this won't match at all. And he said, yeah, don't, don't worry, Johnny, we'll fix it in post. He said, besides, if the shot's long enough for somebody to find a mistake at, in it, the shot's too long. <laughs> and I said, good on you, George. <laughs> Go for it. So I like that. So this was a very small unit. So we had two cameras on first unit with a very small crew with each. You know, first AC, second AC grip, two cameras. And we kept it very straight like that, very simple. I like to shoot with two cameras. Um, uh, I, I always think that's an advantage, particularly if there's any improvisation going on, you can cross shoot, which I think gives the editor a far easier job of cutting those things together. Um, and I like to also put cameras, it sometimes can be very interesting, particularly when you're dealing with people like Sam and Francis, is to have a, a camera on the reaction to the dialogue. <laughs> it's the camera that's shooting the people off, <laughs> you know, who aren't saying the words, their reactions can actually be as interesting as the dialogue itself. Yes, there are details. Yes, there are finesse moments where you have to understand the technicalities, but when you're with individuals and great directors, great art directors, you know, just have fun. Um, I think that's, that's, that's key to me, and that's what uh, a, a cameraman told me when I was clapping boards and polishing boxes. Uh, it was just, you know, it, it, it's have fun. I think I would have liked to have known that, you know, that, that you are good enough. You are good enough, you know, before, you know, when, when you think that, that it's, it's so hard and everybody knows so much more and it's so difficult, you know, it, it, it's, it, it, all, it all makes sense, you know, it, you, can, you, you can do it, you can definitely do it, you know. As a young guy, it would have been nice to know that, it, that, it's, that it's totally possible. Absolutely. I think, absolutely. The main, I think the main thing, when you start working in the industry, I think the main thing that is important is your connections, is, 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 is the people you know more than what you know. You know, it, it, that, that is unfortunately still true. Uh, but if you come in with, you know, if you can show that you have good knowledge and you are good at communicating and, and you can, you, you, yeah, uh, I think, I think every, everything, uh, everything's possible, you know, if you have if you have enough belief, yeah. No, every film's challenging and every day is challenging. You know, the challenge of low budget filmmaking is that you, time, you know, there's always a ticking clock that you're trying to deal with. Um, but you know, to be honest, Three Bubbles was a joy to make from beginning to end, you know. You get there in the morning and there's, there'd be this sort of buzz of anticipation about what work the day's work was, you know. It doesn't matter what it is in a way, just shoot. I, I did that to begin with and some of the, you know, I, I've shot some real old load of crap at times, you know, but, but I kept shooting. I mean, and that, you know, because when you do the things and you make the mistakes and you do the better, you learn just as much from those as from the good work, you know. You learn when things are, you know, it, it, so just shoot as much as you can would be my, doesn't matter what it is, just keep shooting we can perceive a frame in a split second and then after that he's right you might start looking for mistakes and if you find them then you're out of the picture and I think the whole premise that we've all got to the stage in filmmaking is we get grab an audience and take them through that virtual window that we we created and get them into that film get them into the into the area 
and then hold them there. And you can lose them so easily. And then you've got to get them back. So I love that. When George said that, I said, done, George, we're off. <laughs> Keep going.